Welcome back to Introductory Acadian everyone, and today we're going to be taking a look at pronouns and pronominal suffixes. So first I'll take you through the paradigm, and then we're going to take a look at how pronouns work syntactically in Acadian, as well as how they function grammatically when they're being suffixed to nouns, uh, verbs, and prepositions. This is the fourth video that I've done introducing Acadian language, so if you haven't already seen the previous three videos, I would highly recommend that you check them out so that you're fully uh, up to scratch with everything we're about to be discussing today. So first things first, what are pronouns? Pronouns are very simply words which replace nouns or nominal phrases in a sentence. So these are your words like I, you, he, she, it, etc. And as they are replacing nouns, pronouns also have different forms according to gender, number and case. Um, the category or the subject of pronouns in general can be split in two in Akkadian. On the one hand you have independent pronouns, these are words which are whole words and they stand alone in a sentence, and then you have pronominal suffixes. These are pronouns which suffix themselves onto the ends of uh, verbs, nouns and prepositions. So first things first, let's take a look at our independent pronouns. Um, as you can see, we have different forms according to gender, number and person, and then we also have different uh, sets of words for each case. Nominative, accusative genitive, which has been formed into a single um, category here, and dative. So first things first, I'm sure we're all aware of what uh, gender and number are by now, but I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page about person. So first person refers to I, second person refers to you, and third person refers to he, she or it and in the plural they, them. Uh, if you find yourself needing to uh, pick a, an independent pronoun for a mixed group of males and females, then we always pick the masculine form, as is a normal procedure in most modern foreign, uh, modern foreign European languages. So, um, first of all, I want to distinguish between each type of case here. So for our nominal uh, pronouns, uh, these usually form the subject of a sentence. So uh, as such, they'll be translated as I, you, he, she, it, etc. It's important to remember in Akkadian, though, that our verbs already inflect to refer to person. So, for example, if we take the two verbs on the board here, um, these two verbs would roughly translate as I divide, aparas, and you divide, taparas. Now, the subject is already implicit because of the prefixes. So this A prefix is indicating first common singular I, and the TA prefix is indicating a second masculine singular U. So when we're using, uh, when we're forming a sentence in Akkadian, we don't really need to repeat the independent pronoun twice. And in fact, the only time that you ever really see these independent pronouns being used in the nominative uh, is when we're really trying to emphasize the subject of a verb. So for example, in the phrase, Shu is a car. Uh, this translates as he speaks. And our prefix I is already indicating third masculine singular. And our Shu is the third masculine singular nominative independent pronoun. And uh, the, the, the phrase will translate the same, he speaks, but the Shu is there to really emphasize that the subject is him. It's him that's spoken, he has done it. Uh, another occasion in which you might see the nominative pronouns pop up um, is as demonstrative adjectives. So your demonstrative adjectives are words like that, those, these, etc. And we only use the third person uh, nominative pronouns for the, for the um, demonstrative adjectives. So for example, if you wanted to say um, these goddesses, we could say ilatum, this is the word for goddesses and Sheena, which is the third feminine plural nominative pronoun, uh, these goddesses. Or if you wanted to say that which, um, you could say our ship to. This is the word for which, uh, she, which is the third feminine singular um, independent pronoun, that which. Uh, and the final case in which you might see the nominative pronouns pop up um, are when they are being used as the sole subject of a nominal phrase. So a phrase, in other words, that doesn't contain a verb. So if we take an example phrase, uh, a wheelum cardum atta. A wheelum is the noun man, and cardum is an adjective meaning brave, and atta is our 
um, second masculine singular nominal pronoun. So this would translate as you are a brave man. And um, you can see how atta here is sort of implying the verbal form to be. So it's acting as a verb in, in the absence of one. So these are all the potential uses of our nominative pronouns. Uh, if we move on to our accusative genitive set of words, um, this is sort of a multifunctional category in that the, the pronouns can be used to indicate either the uh, accusative or the genitive of a sentence. But in practice, you'll only ever really see uh, this set of words pop up as a genitive following a preposition. So if you remember back to our uh, previous class, uh, all nouns which follow a preposition will go into the genitive case. And it's the same line of thinking which leads uh, this particular set of pronouns to be used following a, a preposition. So uh, if I think of an example phrase, um, manum, this is an interrogative meaning who, and kima, this is a preposition which translates as like or as, and uh, kati, this is our second either masculine or feminine accusative genitive pronoun. And this would translate as uh, who is like you. And we have selected obviously uh, this particular form as opposed to the nominative because it's following a preposition. And moving on to our final set of pronouns, we have the dative and we haven't met the dative before. Um, so the dative is a case which functions as the recipient of an action. So as such, they're translated as to me, to you, to him, to her, etc. Um, usually the dative pronouns will only ever be seen following the preposition Anna, which uh, translates as to or for. So for example, you could have Anna uh, Niashim. This would translate as uh, to us. So those are your dative independent pronouns. So that's just about everything for our independent pronouns. We will take a look at some examples of them from the cuneiform, but first I want to introduce you to the pronominal suffixes and then we can review them all together. So as I've already mentioned, our pronominal suffixes are pronouns which attach themselves onto the ends of verbs, nouns and prepositions. Um, the suffixing element is indicated by the hyphen at the beginning of each of our forms here in the paradigm. Uh, and as you can see from the paradigm, we have separate forms according to gender, number and person. And then we also have three different cases, accusative and genitive, which are in separate um, sections this time, and also the dative pronominal suffixes. So if we start with our datives, um, we will start with the accusative. So the accusative always forms the object of the verb which it's suffixed to. So it will be translated as me, uh, you, him, her, them, etc. And uh, you'll notice at the top that we have two different potential forms for our first common singular. So we have Ani and Nini. The choice um, between them is dependent on the ending of the verbal form or the noun which it's suffixed to. So if our word ends in a consonant, we choose Ani, and if our word ends in a vowel, we choose Nini. So we'll make an example phrase here. Um, Belka. This means your lord, and um, it's made up of the noun Balaam, which translates as uh, lord, and of the genitive suffix, in incidentally, uh, ka, which translates as your, your lord. And uh, Ishbarani. So this is a verbal form meaning um, sent me, and it's made up from the verb shaparam, to send, ishbur, he sent, and ani, which is our first common singular accused of suffix, me. So because the verbal form ends in a, which is a consonant, we've chosen ani as opposed to nini. Your lord sent me, belka ishbarani. And moving on to our dative, we're going to skip the genitive for now. Moving on to the dative forms, um, just like the dative independent pronouns, uh, the dative refers to the indirect object of a verb. So we'll translate as to me, to you, etc. Uh, we also have three different forms to choose from for our dative first common singular. We have arm, the consonant M, and nim. And just like the with the accusative, the option, uh, the choice of the three depends on what the verb or noun, which their suffix to, ends in. So if our form ends in either a lengthened A or a lengthened U, we select nim. Ooh. Or if our form ends in a lengthened I, we go for the suffix M. 
and if the form ends in anything else we select arm. So if we take an example from the two verbal forms we already have on the board, um, apparas, I divide, if we wanted to add a dative suffix to this form we would select arm because the form is ending in a consonant s. Uh, if we say had the uh, second feminine singular um, present tense form, uh, the subject suffix e would be on the end here so therefore we would select m. Or if we had a second feminine plural present tense form, taparas r, we would select nim as our dative suffix as the form is ending in a lengthened a vowel. Another thing to be aware of regarding our dative pronominal suffixes is that by the Old Babylonian period our mimation had begun to fall out of use. So by the Old Babylonian period you would probably see our dative suffixes sounding a little bit more like ku, ki, shu, shi, niashi without the mimation at the end. And similarly, um, by the first millennium, our dative suffixes had actually fallen out of use completely and the accusative suffixes had usurped both the function and the translation of the dative suffixes. So if you were reading a first millennium tablet, our accusative suffixes could be translated as uh, me as an accusative or to me as a dative. And there's just one more thing I want to hit on before we move to our next section. Uh, and that's that our accusative and dative suffixes can actually be used together on top of one another um, in addition to a verbal form. So this would be relevant if you wanted to say something like I sent him to her. And you can see that in within that um, phrase you have both your verb, I sent, him, your accusative form, and to her, your dative form. So all of these would be suffixed together into a single word in Akkadian. So I'll show you an example form so you can see what I'm talking about and I'll break it up into its constituent parts. So we have Ishburu, this is a third masculine plural preterite form um, from Shaparam to send, so they sent. And we have Nim, this is called the ventive suffix and we'll come back to that later. Uh, kum and Shu. So this would translate as they sent him, that's our third masculine singular accusative, they sent him to you, and that's our second masculine singular dative. So when accusatives and datives are being used together like this, we always put the dative before the accusative, which is obviously the reverse in English, so that's something to watch out for. They sent him to you. And then we have our little suffix here, which we call the ventive. And uh, this is actually our next point. It's a really good idea to get to grips with our ventive suffix as you will see it quite often pop up between a verbal form and the following dative and or accusative suffix. So what is the ventive suffix? It is essentially just a repurposing of our first common singular dative pronominal suffix except that it's left untranslated. So the original purpose of the dative was to indicate motion towards a verb. So the best way of explaining this in English is with a phrase like they went to the cinema versus they came to the cinema. And you can see how in the latter phrase motion towards the subject is being implied by the ventive. Um, now in practice as I said this is untranslated and you will just see it pop up between the verbal form and the following suffixes. And there's one more thing that I think it's relevant to note in relationship to all of our uh, suffixed forms actually, and that's that because of a type of sound change called assimilation, it can be quite difficult to spot each of the subsequent um, suffixes in context. So I will show you an example based on the verbal form that we have here and what it would look like if we were to remove all of the hyphens and uh, agglutinate them into a single verbal form. So we would have Ishburu Nikushu. So all that happens with assimilation is that a consonant takes on the value of the following consonant in order to render a word more pronounceable in Akkadian. So in this instance the M of our ventive suffix has assimilated into the K of our dative to create a double K and the M of the dative has assimilated into the sheen of the accusative to create a double sheen. So it reads now ishburu nikushu. Uh, so you can see our verbal, our verbal boundary is still here and all of 
uh, all of the suffixes have assimilated together and it's quite difficult at first glance at least to recognize that each of the uh, that this form is actually belonging to three separate suffixed forms as you become more familiar with verbal forms in Akkadian, it will be sort of intuitive to see where the word boundaries lie. But it's good for now, at a beginner's level, that you understand that assimilation uh, exists and this is the sort of mess that it can get us into. Moving on to our last section, we have our genitive pronominal suffixes. Uh, these suffixes are attached to nouns as opposed to verbs, like our accusative and dative forms, and the genitive pronominal suffix is sometimes called the possessive suffix because it translates as my, your, his, her, their, etc. Uh, an example of the genitive in action would be ina alishu, and this phrase translates roughly as in his town, with ali coming from the noun alum, town, and the shu is the third masculine singular genitive possessive suffix, in his town. Now, before you learn to attach genitive suffixes to nouns, there are various rules which you need to get to grips with surrounding how the suffixes are attached and also the sound changes which take place as a result. And the various grammatical rules are copious enough that the genitives uh, deserve a whole video unto themselves. So I'm going to leave it here for now and we'll come back to our genitive pronominal suffixes in our next class. Congratulations on having made it through all of that grammar into this part of the lesson. So now is the fun bit where we get to take a look at all of the grammar that we just learnt but in the context of a cuneiform passage. So if we start uh, using any notes that you've collected from the lesson, we will be starting from the left to the right. So we have the signs be, el and ka, followed by ish, pur, an ni. So this is the same phrase that we used earlier on in the lesson, uh, Belka Ishbarani, and it is formed uh, using the noun Belum, Lord, uh, plus the second uh, masculine singular um, genitive pronominal suffix, your, so your Lord, and then Ishbarani is the first common singular accusative suffix attached to the verb Shaparam to send, so your Lord sent me. Now, moving on to our second example, we have the signs for Manu and At, Ta, Be, Vi. And this is actually a line from the Tale of the Poor Man of Nippur, which some of you might be familiar with. And it reads, uh, Who are you, my lord? So we have the interrogative who uh, plus the nominative independent pronoun in the uh, second masculine singular, who are you? And then my lord, so we have Balaam, the same noun as we used up here, plus the first common singular genitive uh, pronominal suffix, my lord. And you can see in this example how our uh, independent nominal pronoun is functioning um, in the place of a verb in a nominal phrase. So it's being used to imply the verb to be. Who are you, my lord? Now moving on to our next example, we have e din shum and this is made up of two parts we have the masculine singular imperative verb to give uh, and plus the dative um, third masculine singular so give to him uh, that is our third example give him and then our final form here uh, this is slightly more tricky we have is a ak ka a she and the last line is e ni she so this is made up of two parts we have a verbal form here um, which is made up of the verb zakaram which can be to speak or in this context to name plus our accusative suffix in the uh, third feminine singular so um, she names her is how this verbal form reads and then uh, this word at the bottom is actually a combination of the pre uh, preposition ina plus the uh, noun nishi which means people or nisham so it would have initially looked like ina plus nishi which is the genitive form of the noun nisham so this reads among the people she names her among the people
So that's everything for today's lesson, guys. I hope that you found that helpful. If you have any questions about today's lesson or about Akkadian language and grammar in general, uh, drop me a comment in the comment section below and I will be happy to answer your questions. And until then, we will see you next time and happy translating.